So in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to put together your own home recording studio. That's a subject that a lot of people have asked me about. It's a subject that a lot of people seem to be interested in. I've been doing recording literally since I was in high school. I've also had my own home recording studio probably for the last 20 years or so. So I've worked with equipment and software in both Windows and the Mac. And I've worked with hardware that interfaces with both the Windows and Mac. And I've seen a lot a lot of companies come and go and the landscape has shifted quite a bit. So it's very interesting. So we'll talk about that during the course of the presentation. What I want to try to do in this presentation is I really don't want to get in a lot of detail on any one particular thing. The only thing I want to do is I want to familiarize you with the things that you need to know in order to negotiate the landscape of home recording and be able to talk about it intelligently. That that's what you need to be able to do in order to know what it is that you need to purchase to start thinking about evolving those ideas as to what you would like your home recording studio to look like. And then you'll probably have questions about that. You can put those in the comments and I can go into more detail on those areas. But for now, we'll just stay at a high level. So I'm gonna try to fly you through the treetops of that information at 100 miles an hour. So make sure your seat backs and tray tables are in their upright and locked position. So here we go. So there are a couple of different types of home recording studios. There is an acoustic only home recording studio. For instance, if you're a guitarist, or especially if you play the electric guitar, or even if you play an acoustic guitar that has sort of a plug-in, you might just need a laptop or maybe not even a laptop because you can buy a portable recorder and then just plug into it and press record and you're done. From there, you know, you can do other things with that recording. You don't really need a whole lot of equipment if you're doing something that simple. Now, on the other hand, if you have a piano and you'd like to mic it and you'd like to do more sophisticated things and maybe you're going to do some CDs and things like that, well, now you're talking about a little bit more of a sophisticated setup. You don't need a lot of MIDI stuff because you're not going to be doing MIDI. You don't need a MIDI controller. You don't need certain things. And if you're doing anything that involves MIDI and you also have voice, an example of that might be you're playing the piano, but you also have somebody that's singing or maybe Maybe you're singing and you're trying to put all of that together. Maybe you even have somebody that's playing the guitar or drums and you're trying to put all of that together. Then that's more of a typical scenario for a home recording studio. And it's not very difficult to achieve. We'll look at some different scenarios there as we go through. What I'm trying to do is just kind of give you some ideas so that you can start thinking about how you're going to use the recording studio and what you might need in order to put that together. First thing I'd like to do, and this is kind of the fun part, right, is, you know, let's not get into the technical details and everything else. Let's just look at some recording studios so that we can get our arms around what does a home recording studio look like? And that answer looks differently for each use case. It looks differently for each person's home. It looks differently based on what you're going to do with it, what instruments you play and that sort of thing. So let's get into it. Here's a pretty simple example. Uh, you see this person has a keyboard. They've got a microphone set up exactly like the way that I've got mine set up. They've got a splash screen in front of it, like I've got mine, and, and I think that's pretty important. If you're gonna have a microphone, you've gotta have that. They've got an arm, this arm, maybe it costs $20, and it clamps right under the desk. Dual monitors is nice, and I'm gonna argue that dual monitors is nice if you have a computer. Forget about the recording studio. Trying to look at a laptop screen is like trying to breathe through a straw. Having dual monitors is always a good idea and especially if you're using a digital audio workstation. We'll talk about that. Um, this person's actually using a PC so there's a lot of PC software that works well. That's basically all they have. They have a couple of different things. They've got a set of headphones and it all fits on a normal desk. There may be a keyboard around here but we're not seeing it in the picture. But this is a pretty simple setup and you can see that the speakers that they have are not very sophisticated either. This is a pretty simple clean setup. I'm thinking that this person probably does podcasts or something like that. This is one idea. 
Now this is another idea, and I'm gonna argue that this is gonna be for somebody who is a pianist, because the keyboard that they have is a uh, Derpfer German keyboard. I have to say that I watched about seven different YouTube videos on Derpfer reviews, and the only thing I was looking for on those videos was how to pronounce the name of the company. And believe it or not, no one spoke on any of the videos that I watched, and for the one where someone actually said something, none of them said the name of the company. I have no idea how to pronounce this company. I'm very familiar with it, excepting of course how to say the name, because the action on this keyboard is one of the best and most realistic actions, short of a hybrid piano, which I'll talk about later. Something portable, this is as good as it gets. This keyboard weighs about 60 pounds. It will give you a workout. You'll definitely get some guns carrying in this thing around. It's very realistic and it literally comes in its own flight case. So if you need to take it around, it already has a built-in flight case. And if you look at the desk here, I love this. I want this desk. This is fantastic. It perfectly fits this keyboard and you can just kind of push the keyboard in when you're working from home like everybody's doing these days. And then when five o'clock comes around, whoo, you just pull out the drawer and start playing some music. So that's fantastic. It has a couple of wheels there that allow you to control pitch and oscillation. On the desk, you'll notice that there are two speakers there. They look like simple bookshelf speakers. They're not. These are Atom speakers and they're expensive. The ones you're looking at, probably a thousand dollar pair of speakers, $800 at the cheapest, 400 each. They're active near field studio reference monitors. That's a ribbon style tweeter that can reproduce sounds up to 28,000 hertz, which is phenomenal. The bass is rich, it has a passive radiator in the bottom. The sound from a pair of Atom speakers, you would swear that the speakers were 10 times larger than they are. And that is also the reason he has a piece of foam underneath them, because if he doesn't, then the top of the desk would turn into a speaker too because of the vibration, and that would start to create some odd artifacts that he would be hearing. Um, he has a second monitor here. Notice toward the floor, he has a set of two pedals. So there's no sostenuto pedal, but there's an una corda pedal, and there's a damper pedal. Probably a pretty good idea. And he has it on a rubber mat. So anyone who's ever tried to play portable pedals like that, you end up chasing the damper pedal across the room. That's not fun. Having a rubber mat, probably a good idea. You can see that this person has a second monitor and they also are using an iMac computer. I'm going to tell you that's my personal choice because the iMac gives you a lot of power for not a whole lot of money. A lot of times when you buy a MacBook Pro, you end up paying a disproportionately large amount of money for a computer comparatively smaller amount of power and MacBook Pros tend to wear out a whole lot faster than a desktop computer and the 5K monitor is extraordinary. To buy a 5K monitor, you would have to shell out $1,500. In Costco, I have seen iMac sell for $1,500. So you can get a completely loaded entire computer with the 5K monitor for the same price as just the 5K monitor sold by the same manufacturer that makes the monitor monitors that go into the IMAX. So that's a good deal. Here are a couple of other ideas. So in the top right, that's that same Derpfer keyboard, except they offer an option where you don't get the flight case. They just give it to you without the flight case so you can build a desk around it. And it's the same price. Okay, in the bottom left, you can see that there's a mixing board there. I don't know if that's a Mackie mixing board, but it sure looks like one. I really love Mackie mixing boards because you can get an analog mixing board and they have this technology that can produce very low noise. And if you wire it up as a balanced snake cables and stuff like that, it's almost as good as a full digital setup for a fraction of the cost. Notice that there's a patch bay just to the right of that. And if you've seen some of my other videos, Videos, you'll know that my recommendation is when you have a mixing board, you need a corresponding patch bay and don't forget to label the patch bay it's because there's no way that you're going to want to go behind this furniture and rewire anything. On the left side, you'll see that he has some outboard devices. Having a power conditioner is probably a really good idea too. Now on the bottom right, we see somebody with a lot of outboard processing equipment. One thing about buying a rack is if you buy a rack and you get a couple of components, 
one that's in the rack. It really looks empty and it starts burning a hole in your pocket because you're thinking, you know, I could fit a few more things in the rack. And so you go buy more stuff. And once you do that, then you fill it up. Now you have to buy a new rack and it starts over and it, it really starts to get expensive. I don't know, maybe that was just me but I ended up spending a lot of money. Here you can see that this person has uh, an iMac computer and they just sit it right on top of their desk, but they've got a fairly sophisticated desk and this looks like a fully digital desk. So he has a uh, control surface here that he's using in a uh, trackball sort of mouse and he's using that because he doesn't have room to, to move a mouse around here. So that's how he's controlling his iMac. He's got some outboard equipment, but he's mounted it horizontally and he's got a patch bay here because again, you're not going to be moving wires around on here. You don't need a patch bay for everything. You just need a patch bay for the things that you're actually going to change. So on the left, we have an automated, what we call an automated desk. Those are flying faders. When you're uh, setting your levels during the course of a mixing session, the desk will actually remember the way in which you're manipulating the levels. When you rerun the song, it will move the levers for you. That's kind of neat. Most of us don't need that. It looks like he's running Pro Tools as the digital digital audio workstation there. So on the top right here, you see that somebody has a microphone and they have, this is exactly the same mic rack that I have. Yep, I see the little label on it. It's a Rode mic rack. Again, it's about 20 bucks. And if you're gonna get a mic, get one of these. And this piece comes with it as well. What it does is, you know, if I if I hit the uh, arm here, or if I hit the table, even more importantly, uh, it's not directly transmitted into the mic because if it were, that's what you'd be hearing. You'd be hearing something directly translated into the mic. So it kind of suspends the microphone. It also allows you to move the mic around and, and put it in whatever position you need it to be in. If you're on camera, it allows you to take the microphone out of the shot. I didn't bother to do that because I don't really care. But if I wanted to, I could move this microphone kind of up over my head. And that way it creates the illusion that, that I'm not using a mic and oh my gosh, where did the sound come from? I want you to notice the mixing board in the left of the keyboard. That has has knobs instead of sliders and it's pretty basic. There's not a lot going on there, but a lot of times maybe that's all you need. You've just got a couple of audio sources coming in. You want the ability to mix them, but you don't need to do a whole lot of sophisticated stuff to them. You just have a few standard devices that you use and you just need to bring all those sounds into a single source and then bring that into the computer. That's a good way to do it for not a lot of money and you don't have a whole mixing complexity when it isn't really part of your workflow. So that's an idea. Now here's another clean setup. You know, he's got the rack. Notice the rack is three quarters full. Every time he looks at that rack, he's like, you know, I could fit three more pieces in there. Why not, right? He's got a compressor there. He's got a couple of digital effects, a reverb, and he's got a digital recorder at the top that can output to a CD. That's a bit dated. Um, he's got a couple of Mackie speakers. Bravo, those are beautiful. I have some hanging above uh, that I'm looking at right now. I'll show you those in a minute. And then he's got a Kurzweil keyboard. Kurzweil keyboards great. They feel great and the piano sound from them is great. And he's got kind of an older Mac Pro computer and that's not a bad idea either. He's got a kind of a basic desk and there's nothing wrong with that either. He's got some keyboards that are stacked up in the corner there. So here's another idea too. The keyboards that are stacked up in the corner, they might be stacked up because some of the items that are in the rack are actually synthesizers. And instead of having the whole synthesizer and then having to fill up your studio with synthesizers, you have one keyboard that you like and you drive the other synthesizers through that keyboard and it's a lot cheaper to buy a rack mounted synthesizer than it is to buy one with the full keyboard it's usually about 60 percent of the cost so that's an idea now why on earth this person has fluorescent light in the studio i don't know nothing makes you feel like you're at work more than fluorescent light now we're talking a little bit about control surfaces this is a control surface this is a raven dual mtx basically what it is is if you have well any of the popular digital audio workstations such as pro Logic 10, Pro Tools, those are the big ones. Raven will give you a visual representation of that on these giant monitors, and these are touch screens. So instead of trying to figure out how to grab a slider with a mouse and move it, you can actually just touch the screen as if you had a real mixing board. It is one of the coolest concepts I've ever seen. We'll hit that again later. You can see he's got a MacBook Pro here. Let's see, here's another example of somebody that's using a Raven MTX. This is a dual 
dual screen. You can also use a single screen. And you don't have to buy the deck. You actually just buy the screen and it has its own stand and you can buy one of these screens and set it up and it just looks awesome. But if you do buy the desk, you can put a control surface in here. They sell this as well. You can put the keyboard here and you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with this. This is just insane. They're not cheap, but they're not as expensive as they look like they are. Uh, this particular setup that you're seeing is as expensive as it looks. Let's talk about some of the components that are involved in home recording studios. So now that we've been slobbering over some of the recording studios that we've seen, let's start to develop the vocabulary we need to describe some of the things that we've seen. The first and most important thing you're gonna need, and I'm gonna argue that you need this even if you just have an office, right? You need an uninterruptible power source. And the reason you need an uninterruptible power source, in an office when you have computers, it's nice to have something like this because if the power goes out, and that's not the only danger, but if for some reason with these new types of overly sensitive fuses that they put in the newer homes, if a fuse goes, you might be writing to a drive at that time and you end up losing data and that's not fun. So an uninterruptible power source will do two things for you. The first thing it'll do is it'll leave your computer on and your drives on long enough to finish writing the data and then give you a nice clean shutdown. The second thing that it'll do is, is actually preventative. It will actually prevent those flaky fuses from going off in the first place because they tend to regulate the voltage and they also tend to filter noise out of the power. For some reason, that tends to settle some of the problems that tend to trigger these fuses. I bought a new house. The newer breaker systems have these newfangled fuses that are electronic and they're sensitive to different patterns of current usage and they trip very easily because of that. I have a 10 amp fuse in the office. It should have probably been a 20 amp fuse. It ended up being a 10 amp fuse. And all I did was plug in my office equipment and every time I try to print a page or do anything, I end up having to run outside and and flip the breaker and that got a bit boring real fast and the other thing I started to think is maybe there's a problem with the electrical power and I encourage you to do this as well for nine bucks you can go on Amazon and you can buy a voltometer and just plug it into your receptacle I found after I did that that my voltage varies from 114 volts to 122 volts and it goes up and down like a bride's nighty. it's absolutely crazy that was part of the problem and so I bought bought a uninterruptible power source and most uninterruptible power sources come with a automatic voltage regulator and they also come with noise filters as well. These are good for your computer because back in the old days, remember when you would you were watching TV and mom would start vacuuming and all of a sudden you get snow on the TV. Well, that's that's the noise entering the line that happens all the time. You don't want that noise getting into your computer system or your hard drives because it wreaks havoc on your equipment. And not not only that, but imagine if that's the case, imagine what voltage oscillating between 140 volts and 122 volts is gonna do to your hardware. That's just for computer equipment. Now imagine you're doing a recording. That noise becomes noise in your recording. You're getting artifacts in your recording. And if you're lucky, you'll be able to hear them before you end up sending it out so somebody else can hear them. If you're not lucky, they're gonna hear them first. So if you have a recording studio, it's no longer an open question. You must have an uninterruptible power source. The other thing you're going to need is a computer. So you'll need to make a decision as to what digital audio workstation uh, you're going to use and which operating system it's compatible with. So are you going to use one that's Mac only? Are you going to use one that's Windows only or one that can work on either one and then make a decision as to which one you get? My personal recommendation, the audio industry literally since its inception has been heavily biased toward the Mac world. That's just the way to go. And not only that, if you go to the Mac world, as soon as you buy your MacBook Pro and I'm actually going to recommend an iMac just because you get more bang for your buck with an iMac and they last longer. Uh, MacBook Pros tend to wear out a lot faster and I'm not really sure what the deal is there. Plus you get a 5k monitor and you need a lot of real estate on your screen when you're doing recording for what with the sliders and everything else so you'll really appreciate the extra real estate. So that's what you really want and when you do you're going to get GarageBand right out of the box so you can get started day one recording. There's an upgrade path from there 
to Logic Pro X and you can just upgrade all of your stuff to there. Life is just so much easier when you're in the Mac world. I'll leave that to you to decide. You need an audio interface and those are not expensive at all. I mentioned the Scarlett 2i2. There are other audio interfaces. They're not very expensive, but it allows you to get sound. For instance, the sound from this microphone. There's no place to plug an XLR connector into a computer. So you have to have a way to get this into the computer. There are some different things that you can do. Let's say you're just gonna do podcasts. Uh, you can go to the Apple store and you can buy, there's a company called Blue and they make excellent microphones, but they decided to make one dedicated to people that use their computer to do podcasts and things like that. And it's a great microphone and it plugs directly to a USB. So you can in fact plug it directly into your computer and get great sound out of it. You don't need an audio interface at all. <laughs> there are exceptions to every rule. A lot of people talk about, oh, our audio interface is compatible with USB 3.0. If you look at the amount of data that you need to carry with MIDI and especially even with sound, even if you're carrying 50 channels of sound data, which you're, you're not, but even if you were, you're never going to need a 3.0 level of throughput. 2.0 is always going to be just fine. So don't think you're getting an inferior product if you get an audio interface that's only compatible with USB 2.0. A set of active studio reference monitors. If you are serious about recording, a set of bookshelf speakers is not gonna cut it. You need a pair of headphones. The reason you need headphones as well as studio reference monitors is because if you look at what I'm doing right now, I can't use speakers while I'm recording on the microphone because the microphone will hear the speakers and now you have a feedback loop and blam, you have speaker parts, hair, teeth, and eyeballs all over the room. That's not fun. You also need a microphone if you're gonna do any kind of voice recording or singing or anything like that. You want a microphone. I'll talk about the microphones that I use. Rode has a good set of microphones. Newman has a good set of microphones. Again, you want a little bit more money if you're gonna step up to something like that. Shure has microphones. They're entry-level microphones. If you really are looking for high end, you can do something like Blue, I mentioned was a company. They sell a set of microphones called Dragons, and they even sell them in matched pairs where the material for both of the microphones are literally made from exactly the same stretch of material. And you would use that if you wanted to use them in a stereo pair. For instance, if you were miking a piano, they're a couple thousand dollars each. So they're several thousand dollars a pair. Just depends on what kind of revenue you're expecting to generate from what you're doing. You may need a MIDI keyboard. So these are all things to think about. If you look at this, he's got a MIDI keyboard. He's got a set of near field reference monitors. Now I wanna talk about those for a second because again, that's something you might not be familiar with if you're not used to recording studios. So the experience of using a near field set of reference monitors is sort of like, I don't wanna use headphones, but I need that level of detail in my ears because I'm listening for artifacts. So when you play a set of near field reference monitors, it sounds like the sound is inside your ear, just like in a set of headphones, but it's not. And you're not getting extra sounds either. And the way they achieve this, first of all, unlike consumer speakers, the inside of a studio reference monitor is dampened. So the wood is coated with rubber. They deaden the sound with sound insulation inside the speaker because you don't want to hear the wood around the speaker vibrating, adding artifacts to what you're hearing. You want it to be, you've heard of WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. You want it to be what you hear is what you get. You want to hear exactly what someone is going to hear in your recording before you release it. And that's why you need the near field studio reference monitors. Now, if you'll notice on this desk is an audio interface. That is the Scarlett 2i2, and it's exactly what I use. I've used it for years. It's rock solid, dependable. It has two sound outputs um, that are uh, balanced. And then in the front, it's actually three in one. You can put an unbalanced input quarter inch jack. Why you'd want to do that, I have no idea. You can put a balanced quarter inch jack in the front, or you can put a male XLR balanced audio input, or you can put, like I'm using now, a male XLR input from a microphone or two. One of the interesting things about it is you can level set it, either instrument level or line level. There are switches on both sides. There's another switch that lets you hear the sound before or after processing. There's a button that determines whether you're sending 48 volt phantom power to the mic. My mic requires 48 volt phantom power. 
It's a Rode NT1 mic. That's the microphone I recommend. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's a large diaphragm condenser stereo mic. The other thing that's neat about the Scarlett audio interface is that there's a ring around the volume control that lights up green when the levels are okay, yellow as you start approaching zero, and red as you begin to overload the channel. And you can actually see that, so it's a visual cue that's just really fantastic. And then you have separate volume controls and a headphone jack that's it's just great. I have a set of headphones now that I'm using as well. I am using a set of AKG K92 headphones. If you go to Amazon, you can pick them up for about 45 bucks. When they first came out, they were $250. They have a frequency range of about 20 hertz to about 25,000 hertz, which is insane. And they are the most ridiculously comfortable headphones you've ever worn. These headphones were made for a recording engineer that sits with these on their head for 10 hours and for gets that they're there. I mean, that's just absolutely cool. On the left, you'll see a CyberPower 1325 VA sine wave. And yes, that is the uninterruptible power source that I use. This will power all of your office equipment and all of your critical equipment for a good half an hour to an hour if the power goes out. That's not why you're buying this. You do want to power your computer long enough for all of your hard drives to write their data and then do a nice clean shutdown. So you really only need about five or 10 minutes worth. What you're buying this for is it has an automatic voltage regulator and it also eliminates line noise. That's what you're getting it for. Notice it says sine wave. So there are two types of uninterruptible power sources. Almost every one you get, and if you're at a Costco, that's the one that you're getting, is not sine waves. It does what's called a simulated sine wave. And a simulated sine wave works great as long as you don't have a battery operated device such as a MacBook Pro. MacBook Pro will react really funny to the simulated sine wave signal and it it will cause it to suddenly reboot. And that's not what you want. For that purpose, that's why I got the sine wave because I had a MacBook Pro before and that's what I use for that. So if you do have something that is a battery operated laptop, you want the sine wave. And actually the MacBook Pro is the one that tends to be a little bit more sensitive to this than anything else. Let's talk about some components that you may need. This is like nice to have. You might need a MIDI interface. If you're connecting MIDI devices that don't have a USB device connected already. So if you buy a keyboard, it's gonna have USB right there and you connect it directly to your computer. So you don't need a MIDI device. But if you have a bunch of synthesizers lying around, now you might need a MIDI interface so that you can get the synthesizer data into your computer. That would be the case where you need a MIDI interface. Do you need a mixing board? Most of the time I'm gonna say the answer is probably no. They sure look cool and you saw some of the pictures where they had mixing boards. The case where you need a full digital mixing board is gonna be very rare. They're awfully expensive. You can get mixing boards that record right on the unit. Raises disturbing questions about, well, gee, why did I buy a computer then in the first place? So once again, I think that's a waste of money. I would argue that in most cases, a full desk is probably a waste of money unless you're actually recording an entire band on a regular basis. If you're to the point where you're building your house around your recording studio, whereas you're actually building a cry room into your house and you've got a recording studio that's facing the cry room and you're doing that kind of thing, now you probably need a mixing board. Mackie's a really good one. It's the best bang for your buck. Lowest noise if you're not going full digital. It's absolutely great. Some alternatives for a mixing board, and this is becoming more and more popular these days. Control surfaces. I use a control surface, which is fairly simple. It's, it's got a couple of jog shuttle wheels and a bunch of buttons. And it helps because anyone who's ever tried to turn a knob with a mouse or a trackpad, it's not fun. Think about that. Mine was 99 bucks. You can actually get one for half that. I think it was like 59 bucks to just get a wheel. These are things to think about. And then of course, if you just have too much money and you wanna just spend it, the Raven Dual MTX that I showed you, that's nice. It looks super cool. This is it. Look how sweet that looks. That is just amazing. That's absolutely amazing. You know that guy's happy. You know he's happy. Outboard components effects processors, compressors, digital recorders. You don't need these things, but if you get them, it takes some of the pressure off of your computer. But the main reason you would do this is if you do a lot of live recording. So if you got people that are singing and playing live, the effects processor allows you to kind of 
run the sound through that and control that using knobs and everything else. And then you bring that sound in. Once again, in most applications, it's overkill. But here's an example. This guy's got a rack. And remember I told you about the problem with the rack? Once you start getting the rack, it's, you know, money starts flying out of your pocket. Oh gee, it's almost half full. Well, we got to get some more stuff. Now it's full. We need a new rack. Oh no. Well, I'll tell you what I've got in my recording studio. I have a, the most expensive component in my studio is a Yamaha Avant Grand N2 hybrid piano. They retail for about $15,000. Mine set me back $10,000 because I bought it from a charity and actually was able to deduct that money. So that was pretty cool. I got it new. I also, I bought an iMac 5K i9 8 core 3.6 gigahertz. Can I get it? Amen. 128 gigabyte of memory. Yes, you read that correctly. With a Radeon Pro Vega 48, that's the upgraded video card, and that's because I do a lot of videos. And I got the uh, one gigabyte SSD. So if you don't know much about IMAX, they use the uh, NVMe cards, and they're half a gig each. So they take two NVMe cards, and they run them in a RAID 0 configuration, which is why they're so darn fast. And the one that I got, I got it in a Visa mount configuration. I did not get the stand that normally comes with the IMAX, and then I mounted it on an articulation arm. As I mentioned before, I got the uninterruptible power source. I bought a second monitor that cost me like $300. It's an LG 4K Visa mounted second monitor. The arm that I bought cost me 50 bucks from Amazon. I got a Scarlett 2i2 audio interface, probably 89 bucks. I got two MR824 active midfield studio reference monitors from Mackie, $200 each probably. And that was on a mad sale, but they're incredibly loud. And then more recently, I bought a Mackie CR8S XBT subwoofer. I bought this because it was a couple of months before the product was released and Mackie was taking pre-orders at half the price of the retail price of the product. And so somehow I convinced myself I have to have this. There's a lot of advantages to having the subwoofer for me. One of them is it has a Bluetooth attachment so I can actually attach my phone or anyone else's phone that walks into my office. They can basically basically linked directly to my subwoofer and plug into my entire speaker system and say, hey Terry, check this song out. And they can play it through my speaker system, which is just cool. The other thing is it acts as an additional amp for my speakers. So my speakers are 10 times louder than they used to be with just the amp that's in the speakers, which is really cool. And finally, and this is nice, it comes with an external volume control that I place on my desk and that now becomes the way that I can separately control the subwoofer and the volume without having to reach over and manipulate my audio interface, which is really convenient. And finally, oh yeah, baby, I can get my Cardi B on. I can shake all the windows in the house and bother the neighbors. So, you know. The other thing I have is a Contour Shuttle Pro V2 control interface. This thing works with Logic Pro 2. I also use it very frequently for Final Cut Pro 10 and Adobe Lightroom Classic. It also works literally for every Adobe application. It works for every Apple application, every Microsoft application. It works with over 200 different applications. It's uh, the best 99 bucks ever spent in my life. I have a Rode NT1 Phantom powered large diaphragm stereo microphone. I love this microphone. I've been using it since 1997. Not this one. I bought a new one. I had another one that was a silver one before. They're just, you know, I've had other microphones, but this one, it really just performs and it's not that much money when you look at it. It's like, I don't remember how much I paid for it, but it was less than $200 for what you get. Wow. For cold storage, I use a Western Digital Easy Store 16 terabyte USB 3.0 drive for cold storage. That's a lot of storage. I'm not saying it's the fastest drive in the world. It's not, but it's not slow either. Basically what I do when I'm done with all my sessions, I take everything on my video and audio scratch drive and I just copy it and it says, yeah, I'll be done in 20 minutes and I go to bed. It doesn't take that long to save everything and the drive itself cost me like $170. I mean, you can't really argue with that. The other thing is, you know, I know a little bit about electronics. So what I did is I went to OWC, Otherworld Computing, and I bought a bunch of parts and I built myself a RAID drive that includes four Aura P12 
M2 NVMe cards that were half a gig each, resulting in a two terabyte drive, and then I configured them in a RAID 0 or striped configuration. It is insanely fast. About three gigabytes per second. Yes, that is a capital B, not a lowercase b. Gigabytes, not gigabits. It's super fast. Anytime, and of course, you know Final Cut Pro loves to write large files and take all day long doing it. I don't notice it anymore because it happens so fast. And then when I'm done, I slough it off to the easy store. And yeah, it takes 20 minutes. I don't mind it because I'm going to sleep by that time. We talked about a couple of different configurations of recording studios. Let me tell you what I've got. I'm going to show you what I've got here. So this is the Yamaha Avant Grand N2 piano, and you see the music notes in the background. I just love that. My daughter Crystal got that for me. She's so sweet. Even the scarf on the top of the piano on the left side there, she got me that as well, and I just put it on top of the piano. It, it kind of looks cool that way. The bench is not the bench that the piano comes with. That's a Steinway duet bench. But anyway, that's the piano. I probably should have opened the keyboard, but I mean, you can imagine what the keys look like. And this kind of shows you the, oh, there you go. There's a picture on the top right, has the keys open. And there you go. Top right, that's my studio from six years ago. That is a MacBook Pro, 2012 MacBook Pro. And I had a set of smaller Mackie speakers. Those are studio reference monitors. And remember I was telling you about, like if you're gonna use native instruments, that is the S88. They've since updated that, so it's got two full screens on it now. So it's a lot cooler and it's still the same price, which is really neat. The lights on there, they're blue lights. They light up when you put it on like drums or something like that. They'll color code it so that you know which one's the snare, which one's the bass drum. It's very convenient. And then it'll also color code which notes are not configured with the sound. So for certain instruments, that's really important. And then of course there's sets of knobs that allow you to tweak certain aspects of the sound. So like for the giant piano, you can adjust the reverb and the timbre and you know, different things like that. And then of course there are also buttons for the transport. So when you're trying to record something, your transport buttons are right there on the keyboard. So it does make things, uh, uh, very convenient. And you can see that I've had that Scarlett 2i2 audio interface for quite some time. It's powered by USB, so you don't have to plug it in anywhere except for USB. So that was my old recording studio. Bottom right, that was kind of the next phase. I bought bigger Mackie speakers because bigger is better. Don't let anybody tell you any different. And then I had a 4K monitor and I got the Rode NT1 mic, you know, a little bit of a different configuration there. And then right now, the configuration that I have is on the left. So I've got an iMac that's again on a articulating arm bottom left you can see my shuttle pro that allows me to you know i've got a couple of wheels there so i can do some fine work as i'm scrubbing audio and things like that and of course everybody has to have a mavic mini drone because you just do it's beautiful this is me with application open. And then I've got some cameras there too because i do filming and things like that as well that's my studio and then I can't make a video without remembering the Steinway B that I had, that I sold, that I shouldn't have sold. And I'm gonna cry now, and I don't wanna do that on camera. So I guess that's the end of the video. All right, so that is how to put together your own home recording studio. If you have any questions, anything you'd like me to go into more detail about in terms of particular scenarios, particular use cases, particular devices or components, leave it in the comments. Remember to like and subscribe and thanks for watching the video and I'll see you in the next video. Take a moment right here. Feeling like a sound gear Driving towards the sun With a rose and a gun Feel the wind in my hair Going nowhere I swear